All right, welcome to the Jazz Film School podcast, episode number 256. My name is Brendan Lowe, creator and founder of Jazz Piano School. In this particular episode, I'm going to be analyzing a Bud Powell transcription, pointing out and highlighting new things, and hopefully at this point, you're going to start to realize and see the code to the matrix. And what I mean by that is when I start to point things out, because of the last four episodes I've done, if you haven't checked those out, definitely do so before watching this, things are going to start to open. Doors are going to start to open. You're going to be like, oh my God, that's all he's doing here? I learned all of this. This is amazing, right? I'm going to point out all the things he's doing, what he was thinking, what he was intending. You'll obviously learn some new techniques as well that Bud's playing. But again, for the most part, it's really, really simple when I break it down for you. There's a couple key elements that you need to learn that are going to be in this podcast. And then after that, again, hopefully doors start opening for you and you'll be able to take this and use it in your own playing to incorporate the bebop language. If you haven't done so, definitely go to jazzpianoschool.com. Check out all of our free education. And with that being said, let's dive right in. All right, welcome to the Jazz Piano School podcast, episode number 256. My name is Brendan Lowe, creator and founder of Jazz Piano School. Thank you so much for being here. So this particular episode is going to be on uh, a Bud Powell solo over a tune called All of God's Children Got Rhythm. And um, it's really, really cool. I mean, Bud Powell is one of the masters of bebop and obviously a jazz giant, jazz history influencer, um, and really paved the way for a lot of amazing, other amazing pianists and artists, jazz artists to come from his particular style and whatnot. But I'm the main purpose of this particular episode is going to be to really unify and demonstrate everything that I've been teaching you and showing you in the last couple episodes, the series on Bebop. Hopefully at this point, after you've listened back to all of these episodes, the string of Bebop, you're going to be able to really start to see the matrix, as I like to see, right? If you've seen the matrix, obviously, in matrix number one, at the very end of the movie, Neo uh, is kind of like seeing the code now of the matrix, right? And so before, a lot of students may have looked at Bebop and been like, wow, this look, just looks like a lot of notes. I don't really know what's going on. After you listen to the last four podcast episodes I've done on Bebop, hopefully now you can look at Bebop lines and be like, oh, wow, that's really what's happening here. That's what this person was intending to do. That was their thought process in the moment. That's what's happening. And you can really start to work on it in your own way too. And, you know, obviously the more you understand it, the more it's going to translate into your own playing. And a lot of times the issue that I have with so many people studying jazz or music for that example is that we just play transcriptions and I did this a lot without really understanding them. And knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. When you can understand what an artist is doing, you're effectively going to be able to utilize it a hundred times better than if you were just to play it without the understanding or the knowledge of what's happening, right? So now that you understand what's going to be happening in this particular um, transcription that I'm going to be showing you, because you've learned it, you're going to be like, oh, wow, I get it. I understand it. I can start to practice it. I can use it. It opens so many more doors when you understand the elements, the jazz elements, the concepts, the theoretical approaches, rather than just pulling up a transcription of some pianist and playing it without knowing what they're doing. That's not going to help you that much. And that's normally a lot of the, one of the huge reasons in jazz that I have an issue with, which is mostly why people end up failing at learning jazz. I did for so many, so many years. It's one of the major reasons I started Jazz Piano School to help educate you all, give you the knowledge, explain the concepts to you so you can go in and start to do it yourself uh, in a much more easy, efficient, and optimal way. All right? If you're listening for the first time, we do have a membership available. Go to jazzpianoschool.com to check that out. And uh, obviously, we have a lot of free education as well. Podcast, blog, lick of the week, so on and so forth. And um, I think that's all I got for you today. So let's dive right in. Here we go. 
All right, so I'm gonna be starting here at letter F, and obviously you have the image there available to you to start to follow along with, but this is kind of starting in the middle of the solo because I really want to highlight a lot of the lines that Bud was playing and the bebop approaches he was using. So right off the bat, we have lots of two, five, one. So we have a two, five, two, five, two, five, one, okay? So essentially, we're going from B minor seven to E seven, a minor seven to D seven, G minor seven to C seven, down to the one. So the way he starts to work at this, check it out. He's gonna start from the root. Now his approach is into the third of the E dominant seven chord. Now you need to remember back in the bebop days, the bebop players weren't really thinking about the two minor. They're, normally they're thinking about the dominant chord. So that's why he's approaching this third of the E7 on beat two with the five of the E7 chord. So he's thinking five, four, three. He's not thinking one, seven, and then some note that's out of, you know, B minor. He's thinking about this as being E7, right? So he's just going five, four, three. Now, as he comes up, he's going to place one note, which is again is the five of E7, right? Of E7. He's going to land on the seven. Now, as I start to go through this, check out how many chord tones Bud is landing on on the downbeats when the chord changes, especially when the chord changes, right? Now, obviously, there's some variance to that, but for the most part, that's what's happening. Right? So here's the seven of the E7 chord. Now, this next passage is just a bebop approach into the five of the A minor chord, right? So he's gonna go. All right. So again, what particular uh, bebop approach is he using here, right? I've taught you this. You should know it from all the other podcasts, right? So essentially he has chord scale below. Here he's going to essentially chord scale above. He's actually using a flat nine over the E7 chord, right? This is a flat nine. So he's going chord scale below, chord scale above, chord scale below, half step below into that E natural, which is now the five of the A minor seven chord, right? So he's doing this. Okay, so let's check out the line here. Seven bebop approach into that five of the A minor seven. Now, a lot of the next upcoming notes, that's just an arpeggio. Again, lots of bebop is arpeggios of chord tones and bebop um, approaches strung together with some scalar motion too. Just scalar motion going up and down the modes. That's it. That's really it. Down arpeggio, down the chord tone here. He jumps back up to the flat nine of the D7. Now what is this, right? So he's using the flat nine. Did I say flat seven bore? I meant flat nine. Flat nine of the D7. He's coming down into another bebop approach that falls into the G minor. Chord scale above, chord half step below, into the third of the G minor. Now all that happens is he connects with the D. So he goes flat nine, root. He's just putting a note in between the bebop approach and the flat nine that he started on. Here's where the bebop approach starts. All right, so he has an arpeggio going down. Now again, more chord tone arpeggiation happening here. He jumps up to the seven of the G minor seven. So what is that? That's just arpeggiation of the chord. Seven, five, three. Now here, what he's doing is he's gonna fall into the 13, he's going to go to the 3, flat 9, 7. So this particular instance of what he's doing, the conceptual idea of what's happening is he's taking more or less a chord, right, which is this chord right here. So this is a very common chord actually in jazz where you have the flat 7, flat 9, 3, 13, natural 13. 
And all he's doing is breaking that up. Now, that's not what I covered in the previous episodes, obviously, but it is just an arpeggiation of a chord. You need to remember that. It's just an arpeggiation of this chord. So he hits the third of the G minor. He arpeggiates the G minor. And then he arpeggiates another chord that he's probably played a lot. Again, the 13, third, flat nine, flat seven. And then finally, he jumps back up to the nine. So this is the um, an example of a delayed resolution, right? He's not hitting a chord tone right on beat one of the F chord, right? Or F6 chord. He's hitting a nine. But where does his next chord tone fall? It falls on beat three when he hits an A. So it's a delayed resolution, right? So he hits this nine. Right on beat three is where he hits the third of the chord. So finally, he's resolved to a chord tone, right? So now he's on that A. So here, again, he's just messing around with bebop approaches, but obviously they're not falling on downbeats. He hits that G, but again, it's just a bebop approach, right? So chord scale above, root, half step below, root, then he resolves to the A. And he keeps going, and guess what he does? He just arpeggiates a little bit more. Right now, back in the bebop era, they weren't really thinking about major seven chords. Those you know, there, there were major seven chords, but again, most bebop players were thinking sixth chords, right? So again, this was kind of more of like a, the E natural here is more of a chord scale approach into the six. He does make a skip now. So he jumps to, this is going to be really funny too, a B natural over an E minor seven flat five. So what's going on here really is that he's approaching the third of the A7. So again, he's not thinking about the E minor seven flat five over this chord. What he's thinking here is, is thinking nine over the A7, right? So he's thinking nine, chord scale below, half step below into the three. Now, a lot of times when you would, if you weren't you know, familiar with this education and you'd go to play a transcription and you'd look at it and be like, oh, why is this? Oh, he made a mistake there, right? No, not necessarily. Now, obviously transcriptions, you do have mistakes, but in this particular case, guarantee you Bud was thinking nine, right? Over the A7, leading into the third of the A7 chord. So there's the third, right? So he hits a nine, it's a delayed resolution. He hits a chord tone on beat two, really. You can forget about that E minor seven flat five chord, right? So he does, he does this. He leads back down into the root with the use of a flat nine. Very common bebop move is to use that flat nine to lead down into the root, right? Root. Now again, the passing tone between the seven, the root, excuse me, and the seven is called a bebop scale. It's a bebop scale. Right? So he goes one, passing tone, seven. This allows the root and the seven to land on downbeats to continuously hit chord tones on downbeats. Then all he does is stick a simple half step below approach into the third of the D minor. So let me play this line for you again. I'll play with the A7 chord so you can hear it more functionally rather than playing the E minor seven flat five. Now in the moment, you probably won't even know you, you can barely even hear the rub between the B natural and the B flat because, because of the lead in to the harmonies he's playing over the A7. Because it's going to A7, your ear is, doesn't even realize that there's a clash there, right? Because it's leading into that A7. It kind of guides you into the A7 harmony. Sorry. Right? So you can kind of hear that lead in. So again, slowly, half step below, lands on the third of the D minor seven. And he just goes, just jumps down to another chord tone. Again, you're starting to see how many chord tones are actually being used in this. So he goes, what is that? Just a very easy chromatic approach into the third. So. Right? So once he hits this 
this D natural, right, on the downbeat of three, excuse me, on the upbeat of three, he just falls into chromatic approach down into the third. So again, from here, nine, root, chromatic, right? So just a couple chromatics to lead him into the third of the G7. Now again, more arpeggiation of chord tones. So this time, he just moves up a rootless voicing, which is very common. He'll go three, five, seven, nine, right? And what he does here again is put a half step below approach to get him into the third. So, right? Now here, what's funny about this is because he's not, he's landing on the B flat actually which is the downbeat, okay, of beat three. So technically, as he's doing this, right, you're having the downbeat, and then this is on the upbeat. So again, all of these things can be played. Again, there's no, there's no hardened rule, like 100% time you have to land on chord tones, right? But if you do get yourself or play a situation like this, essentially, you know, it's a delayed resolution of some sort. So. So finally, the G natural is the next chord tone he hits on the downbeat. And you could argue a lot of this approach here, you know, leads you into that nine of the C7 here, right? And then finally he hits more chord tones and lands on that G natural on beat two. So again, for the whole line for that G7 bar, and again, this is bar um, seven uh, from letter F from the uh, transcription here of the image that you're probably walk watching along. Nine, seven, five. And then he just continues down the scale to get to the three. Right, another common arpeggiated line with a little scalar motion at the end to resolve into the three. Right, so if it's not a bebop approach, it's probably an arpeggiation of some sort. If it's not an arpeggiation of chord tones, it's probably arpeggiation of some sort of voicing, like a nine uh, rootless voicing. If it's not some sort of arpeggiation, it's just scale or motion that's happening of the mode. That's really it, that's how bebop works. Right, now obviously there's some extensions that are happening. So what happens here? Jumps up to the flat nine. He goes to chord scale below, half step below, into the five of the one chord, right? And he has this cool little thing. So again, that's just the bebop approach right there. You have the flat nine, bebop approach, chord scale below, half step below, one, or excuse me, the five, which is a chord tone, obviously. Half step below, chord tone, half step below, chord tone, five, all right? So let's walk back through all that slowly and start to really kind of put it together. So again, he starts on the root, or excuse me, the five of the E7 chord. He's thinking five of E7, and he's gonna move down to the third. Scalar motion, third arpeggiation. Arpeggiation here, right? Now he gets a B, now he uses a bebop approach to land, to move him into the A minor. So chord scale below. Half step below, five arpeggiation down the quarter tones. Jumps up to the flat nine. He connects the bebop approach he's about to use with one note, the root. Chord scale above, half step below into the third of the G minor. Jumps down, up, excuse me, to chord, more chord tones, more chord tone arpeggiation. Lands on the 13 here, outlines a voicing. 13, three, flat nine, flat seven, jumps up to the nine. Finally resolves to the third, right? Just uses the bebop approach here. Three, five, seven, six, right? So again, more arpeggiation up to the seven there, down to the six. And then here, again, he's thinking nine of the A7 leading into the third of the A7. Right? Jumps down to the flat nine of the A7, 
root bebop scale. So the bebop scale is the passing tone. Half step below into the third. Five. Okay, two chord tones. Takes a pause. So again, this is a nice little line over D minor to lead you into the third of the G. Again, he's just coming down. The scale, scalar mode adds in, right? A bebop approach there to get him into the third. Again, more arpeggiation of chord tones. Goes up to the nine this time. Okay. Slides into the third with a half step below approach. Lands on the nine with the bebop approach. I think I'm going to sneeze, but maybe not. Hopefully not. <laughs> Nine, seven, five. Again, more chord tones. Just the chord scale above resolution into that E. Again, you can think of it as chord scale above or just a scalar motion step. Jumps back up to the flat nine. More bebop approaches. Again, more bebop approaches, right? Half step below, third, half step below root okay that's where we're going to end today um, because i'm going to break this up into a couple of different parts to analyze everything that we talked about but again what do you notice he's using bebop approaches at the ends of the lines to connect chords so the bebop approaches usually are at the ends of the lines that he's using and it leads him into the next chord the chord tone he's using lots of chord tone arpe arpeggiations and lots of different types of chordal arpeggiations too. So obviously, if he's going to arpeggiate, he doesn't just arpeggiate from the root. He usually might he might arpeggiate from the third going up to the nine. He might arpeggiate from the third going up to the seven over the G minor, coming back down. He lands or starts lines on extensions, flat nines, thirteens. right? And it's obviously using small bebop approaches all over the place to resolve into the next chord to help him land on those chord tones. Because again, the chord tones is what emphasizes the harmony. They're the anchors of the chord, right? They're the chord tones. Those four notes literally produce the sound of the chord. So wouldn't it make sense to actually reflect those notes in your solo on you know, prominent beats, meaning down beats when the chord changes? Absolutely it would. And the bebop approaches that I've explained in the last three episodes are utilized, right, to build tension and then resolution. Tension and resolution, right, to move through the harmonies. That's what bebop is, okay? So again, play this solo, learn it, study it. I'm going to keep going over more parts of this solo, but hopefully that was really helpful. I hope, you know, after everything I've taught in the last four episodes on bebop, Really, you're, the matrix is starting to open your eyes right now and you're starting to really be like, oh my God, this is, it's really not that hard. Now, playing it in a spontaneous fashion, that's difficult. That's a whole nother ball game. How do we practice spontaneity? How do we practice bebop approaches, scalar motion, arpeggios, so we can have it come out in a spontaneous motion? You know, there is a system, there is a strategy to doing that, but just the learning it and understanding it is key. It's your first step to being able to get your spontaneity happening, right? In your solos and being able to do this. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. Don't forget to go to jazzpianoschool.com to check out all of our free, amazing education, all of the free podcast blogs. We do have a membership if you're looking to take a next step forward with us, get access to over a thousand different jazz piano videos, playbooks, mini courses, a main course curriculum, success path, and so much more. If you have any questions, feel free to email us at support at jazzpianoschool.com. I hope you have a wonderful day and as always, happy practicing.